for the yeah give me a second for to find the slides <laughs> and i will uh just for anyone watching on YouTube, we are uh, winging it a little bit for today. Our our speaker or our uh, presentation leader wasn't able to make it. So um, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Sound slides, let me share my screen. Great. All right, can you all see it? Or am I sharing yes. the am I sharing the right screen? But oh, does it say communication? Okay. Yes. Good. Okay, awesome. All right. Yeah. So let's uh let's swing this. Our objectives today are really focused around uh, communication and specifically around how do we communicate our data to others and in a meaningful way. And then a lot of this kind of is focused around visualizations. I mean, that's why I communicate a lot of my things. Uh so maybe we can kind of do a deep dive into some ways of optimizing those uh, figures that we learned about in the first chapter to, to make them a little bit easier to understand and how to, to kind of increase uh, knowledge transfer. All right, uh, Albert Caro, that name sounds so familiar. Um, the, the goal of this chapter is to, uh, I guess the, the quote of this is to just focus on uh, conveying information, I guess. I'm more familiar with Tufty than I am Albert Caro. I think Caro was involved in um, a couple of really good data visualizations that I don't remember off the top of my head. He's a, a data journalist. He has a couple of books and they focus on, it's like, um, yeah, How Charts Lie is the one I was trying to think of. Yeah, but... I, I, he's super famous for another thing too, was it? Yeah. Did he do the, he didn't like redevelop Ansem's Quartet, did he? Was that oh. someone else? I thought so, I thought his name sounds very familiar in that world, but I, uh, I th he has done that. That sounds right. Um, so anyway, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. I know him from uh, social media. He's pretty active, and um, yeah, I'm not sure why there's not even a quote. Like it's a, yeah. uh, just yeah. a m reference to a quote. That's the fun with slide karaoke. Yeah, this is great. Well, we're just gonna chug through it. I guess there's some <laughs> like there's some really good examples of uh, some GG plots uh, from the. I've actually used this kind of template before when I was first learning GG plot to learn of like all the super cool things you could learn. Uh, I've been slowly learning GG animate. At some point, I, I think there's a couple people who kind of done Tidy Tuesdays and made like a. A GG plot Tuesday, where they do a tidy Tuesday and they focus on trying to learn a new GG plot based off of that version of a tidy Tuesday. And I'd like to do that for GG animate at some point because I think that'd be awesome. And uh, a squeezy is pretty cool if you've heard of that before. It's like a drag and drop GUI someone made uh, for like doing just data visualization plots. Um, that's really neat too. It's weird because you like open our studio and you run it. And it makes, it's like a software within a software. So it makes like a pop-up that you get to use. It's really weird, uh, but it's kind of cool. Uh, if any of you are familiar with Jump, which is like SAS's version of like a interactive GUI, uh, it does something similar to Jump. So. I would just say, I mean, if you do get into GG Animate, be very, very careful. Um, a lot of GG Animate should have just been uh, all on one plot or a facet maybe because it makes it if it depending what it is it can make it harder to see the information oh yeah Be, yeah so uh, Just, uh like it's it looks cool okay, like yeah. those ones that they showed actually i think those were probably a good use case a lot of times if it's yeah. over time and it's a whole like series yeah. of things that are changing over time yeah uh, it can be helpful but yeah that's exactly cool. yeah this that's is cool. uh this oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. That would be my question. When would it be like uh, recommended, or what would be some use cases for using GG Animate? Because I I'm looking at some data that maybe if they change over time, it it seems like it could could be uh like a group of data, a group of uh, variables that change over time, but they are um like instead of because the example that they that they have on the on the the ggplot um, gallery you can see how a group of data is shifting 
to right. upwards or, or, or so that kind of uh, uh, cases would be like good use cases to 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 use uh, animate or which others I I I think so and um it's you know where you have I mean the third variable doesn't have to be time but often time is where it makes sense and it's like where you have a whole plot at each time point cuz a lot of times people just have effectively it's a point at each time point and then time should have just been an axis but instead they make it an animation and that's not you know exactly. yeah that's not helpful yep exactly. but uh, and you know um it depends on your context of where you're going to show it there's lots of different things obviously you know we're going to get into a lot of different things than that in the actual chapter but it it's a fun package you can do some really cool things with it um but just you know it gets overused in my opinion a lot and then the other thing just while we're on it is um like pause at the end or bounce back and forth or something so that it's not just it gets to the end and you can't actually see how it ends um that's something that I think people screw up a lot too, that they'll have something where I'm watching it and it's doing this slow build, slow build, and then you can't really see the last frame because it's only there for a fraction of a second and it jumps back to the beginning. So um, there are functions, there's a, a setting when you do a GG animate or I don't remember what it's called, but to basically pause at the beginning and pause at the end. And that is very helpful when you're doing anything animated. I was hoping to find while you were talking, there's a really beautiful video done from our medicine. It might be 2021 or it might be 2019. I get them all mixed up in my head, <laughs> but they did like an amazing job presenting on how to do like beautiful GG enemy uh, presentations. And maybe if I, uh, maybe later on, if I have time, I can try and like find it and you can send it out. Because uh, it, it was done really, really well. Um, and it's like only like a 10 minute presentation. I think I just found it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just gonna add it to the link here. I won't. I won't uh, present on it. I was hoping to find like an example of her work. It's a uh, Dr. Kristen uh, Panthagani. It did some really really good work on this. Okay, there. Yeah, it's in the chat if you're curious. Oh yeah, and this is just a GG anime plot from my own blog, uh, which is called Slow AI because my last name is SVLO and then Fast AI. It's just really funny. I just thought it was hilarious. But I use GG <laughs> anime in this plot for uh, simulated annealing, kind of going from one figure to another, uh, which I thought was kind of cool. But you're right, yeah, like domain information can be difficult with GG plots. So uh, this first example that they talk about in the communication chapter is around uh, using labels and annotations to help describe a plot. Um, so, you know, you, you can just have the plot itself, right? But without any context, it's a little bit confusing. You need to at least label the x-axis and the y-axis, right? And, and ideally, when you're kind of plotting this information, having some type of header or footer kind of information can also be super useful. Normally, when I plot this data, I usually actually have the I actually have the title in a quarter document or an RMD file, not the actual plot itself, which you know has its own limitations. If someone just copy and paste the the image itself, the PNG to use in another thing, but I have no control over how they use that data, right? Um, but uh, in the bottom left or right corner, I usually try and have some data around where the results come from. I think in this specific example, they use the University of Wisconsin. Uh, originally from, uh, they, they cite the original source of the data, which I think is pretty valuable. And then uh, they do a couple other fancy things here as well. I don't, I haven't had a lot of experience using quote and, and maybe I should move to quote. I've used expressions in the past in B quote, which I think is an older school way of adding equations to your X and Y axes. Uh, I think it's about time I changed. This looks way easier. <laughs> Or, you know, sometimes I just shove in LaTeX and pray it works. And sometimes it magically does and other times it doesn't. So I, th I think I, I think it's about time I, I change to the more updated <laughs> version. Um, I, I love the name of this theme though, TV themes, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. 
That's pretty funny. I, I didn't know about this package before this. Um, there's a really good Wes Anderson themed color palette that's also really fun to use every once in a while. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I have found that using um, equations in plots has always been, or tables even, has always been a little bit tedious. And I think it's finally turning a corner um, with the use of quote here, so. Does anyone else have experience with equations in uh, plots? All right. No, I, I was. I've done. Uh, every once in a while, I'll dip into um, the GG text package where you can use Markdown, and that not necessarily for um, equations, but just for for fancy things on labels. That can be really nice. Yeah, like I think are you thinking like GG Repel in like Geom text and stuff? Uh, no, specifically the package GG text. It lets you do um R markdown in your labels. And so you can do bold and italics and different colors and fun things like what? that. Okay. I need to get on this. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad we decided to talk today because uh this is great actually. That's really, I'm actually working on an anti-biogram project right now. So like this example is very topical. Kind of trip me up for a second. Oh, and pictures. Yes. Okay. Awesome. And they kind of discuss uh, some of the other data sets that they're going to be using. Uh, I'm sorry I'm going through this kind of fast, but you know, I think we're all like we're all some of us who have read this have already aware and you know, I wasn't planning to present. Um, I think this is uh interesting idea. I think there should be definitely a balance between, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we all experience sometimes you can get overloaded with text information in a plot and, and it is it really helpful. I, I don't know if I'm in love with the style of this plot, for instance, right? Going smaller, you can't even really see what city they're talking about and then going all the way up. But um, I think there's advantages and disadvantages. And then I next they just go to a, a couple other themes. And this just talks more about adding labels within the plot, uh, right? So you know, adding like a geo text or GG text. I have found that I, I'm not sure if anyone else has experienced this, but when they add a geo text um itself into a plot, it'll it'll overlay it multiple times so it'll look kind of blurry. So you have to either make a separate data frame for the results and then import it or do some type of subsetting. So you're only taking one row. I'm not sure if anyone else has experienced that before, but uh, yeah, that definitely, it's, when I've used a geom text in the past, I've had that kind of issue. Cause it'll, if you have like 10 rows in your data frame and you make a geom text, it'll overlay that exact same position with 10 of the exact same text because there's 10 rows and then it'll look really blurry. Yeah, these are just a uh, different definition of how to use H just. I wish I knew about this when I first was learning R, because I oh, for me, I'm sure some of you have experienced this too. Whenever you're using H just or B just, I just kind of go between every iteration of zero and one or one and one point five until I get what I want. And that usually gets me there, but like, you know, it's a uh, kind of a tedious process. So Now scales, uh, this package is super useful. Um, you know, they have, they have the classic like scales, but it'll fill over radius, which is more like uh, changing the color palette, but there's also scales like uh, percent and that are used for the labels and, uh, and other things as well. Um, one weird thing about scales that I've noticed, I'm not sure if I have an example. Um, I'm not sure if, will this work as an example? Well, none of these are percents. If I change this to a y-axis for a second, I mean, I've changed this to a percent for just for a second. And then if I were to add, can you see my screen right now? The uh, R code? Okay, cool. So if I add a uh, scales, oh, sorry. Anyone? And then if I add uh, labels equals scales dot dot percent, I'm not sure if anyone else does this, but I've noticed that you can't add, this is the way you add the percent to the scale if you use the scales tag. So, so it made this y-axis into a percent. But if you did something like uh, scales 
and then you did like dot and then accuracy, I think this breaks. Yeah, so because you know dot's not found. So then you either have to add highway divided by two, which I, I'm also not sure if this will work without calling into the data frame. Uh, yeah. So then you'll have to do a whole aesthetics around the scale back of news to get it to work. I always found that kind of weird. I also find it a little weird that you don't add parentheses to this function call. It makes me uneasy, but I do it all the time. And then I get the percents that I want. So I guess it doesn't really matter. But uh, um, the, yeah. Well, the, the reason there is that you're giving it the function, not the result of the function. And then, and when scale Y continuous sees that labels is a function, it uses, like it has rules of, oh, okay, that means I have to use that function to build the, the labels. Oh, and interesting. So, yeah. So like the, the scale Y continuous function inside is calling that function after it does what it needs to do to sort it out. Oh, okay. All right. That, that makes sense. Yeah, I've always wondered about that. It always makes me uneasy that I can't use, uh, I can't like pass it a period because I'm just so used to that functionality and other things. But it makes sense when it's like a function within a function. Kind of like when you use a, a cross or something like that, right? It's a function within a function. So you don't add the parentheses around it. You just put it in as an argument. Right. Yeah. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, the uh, labels argument can also take the label percent function uh, according to the current book edition. Oh, interesting. Wait, the, the what argument? So it's the labels argument. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it can, you can pass it the label underscore percent um, function. And then with, with um, parentheses. Actually, but uh, I, I should have a look in the book itself. Uh, just, so just could, uh, have... would, would I do it under labs right here? And then I do it for Y? No, in uh, like in scale X continuous or whatever. Okay. Like, so there you send yeah. it uh, like label percent. I don't know if it even comes from scales anymore. That yes, it's from, yes, it's from scales. It's from scales. Oh, it okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll... And you call it as a call. So that one you do include the parentheses. Yeah, I'll paste the uh, I'll paste the chunk from the book in the chat uh, so that you can see. Ooh. Oh, that's cool. Yes. All right. So if that's... I if I wanted to add a, uh, I want to add some significant figures to that. I mean, I, I I was hoping it would highlight to tell me what the function calls are. Well, let's just use two. We'll see if that works. Well, I, that wasn't helpful because the default. So let's we'll see. Oh, that's cool. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, it's a, that is returning a function is what's happening there. So that function call returns a function. Um, and so when you give it different arguments, it returns a slightly different function, um, which is a whole uh, chapter of advanced R. <laughs> oh, so we should, so we should go into this too. We should go into this QD. Well, how it works, we don't need to go into, but yeah, uh, that it works, that. Yeah. it's fine. <laughs> yeah, Advanced R is a great book. Uh, I started learning C++ for R through that book. Oh, um, yeah. What, uh, there's something else I want to mention while I was like on this topic um, of these. Oh yeah, I'm sure you've used pretty breaks before. Like one of my favorite ways to break things if I'm doing like a whole bunch of plots. So I, I think, I can't remember if we talk about it later on here, but uh, breaks, scales, pretty breaks. And then if you want eight different breaks, uh, you can just add it and then it'll, and it'll make the plot here, which I think is really, really useful when you're generating multiple plots with varying levels of varying breakpoints in the y-axis between that and the expand function. So you can say, oh, I want it. I, so that way nothing goes above or below and you can see everything. You can change the expand at the top. So like it's, always 10% more than the, the highest value or something along those lines. I don't know. I, I found that to be another super useful thing. All right. So we kind of just talked a, a kind of a bit about themes. Uh, themes, uh, you know, it's a really easy way to make your lot, your plots look super pretty right off the bat. Um, one thing I noticed about the examples here is that they, um, Always keep the default expand at whatever that default is. Uh, I usually 
it's almost like a knee jerk reaction for me to turn expand into zero zero. So that way there's no space in between my X and my Y axis here. And I think all expand does is it changes the X and the Y axis to be centered at the bottom of the graph, essentially, right? Yeah. And uh, I don't know, does anyone have a favorite theme? I, I usually, my, my favorite default theme that I use is theme BW. It's just, uh, I like to box around my facet wraps when I have multiple wraps. Um, I don't know, minimal's too minimal for me, uh, unless, or I use void, I go full toughy. It's like, I like either box or I like absolutely nothing. I don't know about any of you, but. I, minimal is probably my favorite. <laughs> yeah, a minimal, really? Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Totally different, that's funny. And, and then, and then build up, you know, or, or yeah. theme oh, void yeah, yeah. and build up. Like yeah. I'll, I'll put things back, but yeah, I I don't like the default. I, I like the background I on the plot drives me crazy. I think I think um, this one's closest to default. Yeah. 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 Um. I do like, I mean, I like some number of lines, but like to tightly control that basically, <laughs> like yeah, make sure they're absolutely. highlighting something that's useful. Of course. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, it's hard for me to say, like, I like, or so I think saying that I start from minimal or void and building up is really most accurate because it depends what you're trying to show. Um, mm -hmm. And all that said, I, all my initial work, I, I don't bother with themes, like they're, pretty much the last thing I do. Um, at my my old job, I did take the time to write a theme package so that we could just have all our stuff all set pretty easily. Um, I, I do find that super helpful, especially uh, we have a default, my company, we, we have a default color palette package that our team uses. It's a small team though, it's a team of five. So we make a package that only five people use. It's pretty easy right. to manage. But you know, we always keep the most update company colors in that for that reason. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. And it's it's nice. It is. And you know, most of the time I don't use the company colors because I don't like them. I stick to like <laughs> a series of other colors that look, I think, more aesthetically pleasing to the graph, but it's nice for for some of the more official presentations and stuff. So exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I do really like theme void and building because when I think about making like a PowerPoint slide or something, you you can really easily like highlight let, let's just say like you have this graph right here if you want to highlight the red one you could start off with this as all gray and then the next slide or next quarto slide you could just make this one red and then have the number above it and then describe what it's showing or something and having all that little less noise is, is really aesthetically pleasing so. all right uh they focus i guess well okay there's really nothing on this slide about yeah. saving plot. Uh, this is uh, certainly, so they didn't even go through uh, patchwork. Or yeah. Uh, okay. Well, right. Well, yeah. One of the ways to save plots is with GG save. I actually uh, might have some better raw code. If I'm just going to open up my own R program, I think I might have some examples that uh, would be more useful. I use does anyone here use egg or gg array eggs version of gg arrange there's actually quite a few packages like patchwork and all those that that make their own versions of uh gg arrange for like faceting multiple plots together i had started to play with things uh cowplot was the other one that was really popular and yeah. then uh klaus wilkie who wrote cowplot like started recommending on Twitter that people should use patchwork. So I was like, okay, then the wars are over. <laughs> it's time to use okay. patchwork. <laughs> I I usually need to buck up and start using patch, patchwork. <laughs> I've been going with egg because uh I'll just show you egg. Don't use egg. Okay. This is, okay. I'm just gonna show you it and then we'll I think do, uh, I'll find the vignette for patchwork really quickly and we'll go through it. Uh just because I think it's important to understand. Egg uh, is really cool because it automatically aligns your plots depending on how you want them. So unlike ggplot, well, the, unlike the old school gg arranges, it wouldn't automatically line up the x-axis of your plots. I'm trying to like draw you with my fingers. You would, uh, it, they could be mismatched depending on the size of the plots. Whereas here, like even though this figure has uh, this legend variable, it knows that this figure over here doesn't have a legend. So it'll match the y-axis together, mm -hmm. which is like, Saves you so much time. It's like really, really nice. 
And I guarantee Patrick probably did it as well. Yeah, you can do some really nice things with patchwork. Um, and it's like, it's in the book now. It's in oh. the current edition of R4DS. Uh, it's authored by the lead author on ggplot2, um, the, the, uh, Thomas Lynn Peterson, who, like, owns ggplot2 now, basically. Yeah, so, yeah. um, so yeah, it's just it's really nice. It uh when you need to compose plots, uh you know, put them all together in a nice way. It has lots it, of commands and it makes it it's like it's such it's a really straightforward syntax. Yeah, look at that. Wow. I, yeah. honestly that's like I'm a little jealous. <laughs> what am I doing with my life? I just like I just saw that. I know exactly what that's doing and I know exactly how to do it extremely tediously in egg. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, it, it's about time I switch. That's that's wonderful. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. So the or statement will have everything be on the same row and the divide statement adds, sorry, everything on the same column and then divide will add everything to a new row. That's that's really a set. That's awesome. Other it was you said it right the first time. It's the same row for the ors. Oh, so did? those okay. are row 1 and then yeah. p4 okay. is row 2. Row 2. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I never really egg, I never knew about egg actually. That I had somehow never heard of that one. I think I just was really frustrated with Calplot one day. I, I thought there might have, and I just uh, didn't do, because I was trying to align the x-axis, which is really important for this one plot where one of them had a legend and the other one didn't. And it just, it's like, just iterate, let it load, iterate, let it load. You know, at the time I was dealing with like a 900 uh, DPI image. So then it's like, you wait. I should have just downloaded, I was should have just downloaded, uh, lowered the resolution while I was messing with things, but I didn't. Because I was stubborn, but uh, yeah, uh, this looks way easier. Well, so I think that covers in, in you know save plot. I don't think this goes through all the function calls. I just want to quickly just show those because I think it's an important. Uh, let's see. Seeing an example here of what the function calls look like. I will, uh, I'm just going to pop over my R program that I was sharing. I'm just going to show what those look like. Yeah, I was doing a passing bad block regression. I'm going to put this PB. doesn't really matter. I use uh, I use the uh, call to the notebook a lot, which is why you see this uh, params number sign notebook ID, but, but that doesn't really matter. I'm just going to change that. And I use here here a lot too. Also not important. Actually, I might just get rid of this because I think it adds more confusion than than not. Uh, all right. So you know, uh, just like if you're plotting like a G, if you're plotting a, a figure and you want to save it out, you can add your file name here. You can change the DPI. I usually stick to somewhere between six hundred and nine hundred. I found that at least for academic journals, they they always want the highest DPI they can get until they realize how high you can make an image and they and it won't even upload to their server. So like, you know, you have to, there's a, there's a balance there. Um, also, I usually stick with PNGs. I know TIFF files have, are pretty popular as well. And I think you can also save out the SVG through GG save. I can't remember, which is kind of cool because if you need to add this to like an Adobe Photoshop or something, I think those mostly prefer SVG files. And then like simple stuff like height and width is also easy to change as well. So. Oh, and is that is that it? Uh, I thought there is. Uh, I might just quickly go through and see. Oh, we didn't we didn't even talk about zooming, which is also super yeah. cool. Um, it is something that people like screw up a lot too. Yeah, that you have to be careful that you're not cutting things off rather than zooming, um, uh, you know, use the the chord functions, not X limb and Y limb. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed that. Um, zoom is really nice, there's a couple of Zoom packages. I, I, I used Zoom like six months ago, but the paper's not out yet, so I can't show you the figure that I use it on, but it's mm -hmm. really, it, it's really helpful when you have like a lot of information, or if you're dealing with something with an extremely large scale and, Let's just say for this ex specific example, we had this 
uh, this biomarker that we were using where um, most of this systematic review we were doing, most of the values were between one and 10,000. But this one paper published a value in, that was close to 120,000. So when you when you try and plot all those together, it scrunches up everything below, <laughs> right? It scrunches everything up on the scale. So there's a couple of ways you can look at that, right? You could log it, but then it's completely uninterpretable to everyone who has never seen the log form of it, but it spreads yeah. them out. So you can see what's occurring across the distribution. A lot of people do like breakpoints, which I think there's a package that allows you to do that, where you kind of cut the data between uh, 10,000 and like 90,000, and you just make those disappear, and then you show 10,000 onward. But you know, if someone's quickly glancing the figure, they're not going to know that there's a cut point there, right? And I even right. think Hadley Wickham disagrees. I think there's a Stack Overflow post where Hadley Wickham posts on there, you shouldn't do this, but this is how you do it, <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, and uh, I think there's a uh, the other one's zooming, right? And zooming is where you have the big figure and then you kind of zoom out and you show the uh, little box where where you show like that, the part that you're interested in that smaller portion. And the zooming is super useful for that. Um, I do they give a good example of zooming here. Let me see. I, yeah. I think zooming, they just are doing individually, like- Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Changing okay. the the- scales or the, yeah. not the scales the, the coordinates that you're looking yeah. at and, and there's a couple um, packages that allow zooming if i remember correctly right uh i mean you can do it with patchwork depending on what you're doing um i haven't done a ton so i don't have a good answer there yeah i do know um on the uh, Hadley Wickham will weigh in on things. Uh, there are always like multiple threads about how do you do two act two uh, y axes. Yes, that, that's, the other one. that's the other one. Two. And he, he's like, um, you don't because that just confuses people. <laughs> and then so, people, like, people you can do it, it yeah. but almost always it's doing something bad. <laughs> like, Right. No, no one can really interpret that information. Right. Yeah. yeah. Only do it if if there is some sort of correlation between those two different axes. Like, you know, these points should be near each other. But I don't, yeah. even then, I, I don't know. Split it. Make two different plots yeah. that are next to each other. Yeah. I thought, <laughs> uh, am I still sharing my screen? I can't remember. Yes. So we are seeing see a if... PDF. OK, great. Yeah. So this is from a paper that I got published a while ago in uh, Scientific Reports. You know, there's just a couple other thing, ways of conveying information that I really like. Um, just because we have time and there's nothing else to present <laughs> on. Uh, like, attribute plots are super cool. These are in a supplementary appendix for a reason, because they're still kind of hard to interpret, so I, I apologize. But, uh, you know, in this case, you know, we're looking at uh, things that were removed from our data set, right? So we removed, uh, like, abnormal mean arterial access, for instance, in this specific paper. And so how many instances of that were removed? And then you can combine it with, oh, how many were the patients not assaulted and they also did not have amino arterial access. And so you can look at this one where the two pots, two points are there and you can see what the total count is. I think attribute plots are really valuable for looking at those kind of two, uh, if you have multiple comparisons you're looking at, at the same time, how many of those uh, joint dependencies um, are being removed at the same time? Right, it's kind of neat instead of just showing the overall summary, which is pretty cool. And uh, on top of that, we also showed that uh, this is specifically in uh, uh, ECG waveforms in dogs. So you know mm -hmm. that's interesting. Um, but uh, we also did another GG plot of a GG repel where we had mean age on the y-axis and then mean weight on the x-axis, just as like a quick and dirty what do these animals look like? Once again, this is in the supplementary appendix. So it's not not super important, but it is interesting to look at. And you know, it gets messy trying to convey this information, right? How, how do you do it? If you tried using um, if you tried using colors, there's way too many animals here to do colors appropriately, right? But you know, even with GG Repel here, you can see it. It still looks pretty messy, no matter how you how you look at it. Maybe a table would have been more appropriate than trying to show uh, it as a scatter plot. But you can quickly see that, like Great Danes, they uh, they're younger. They die. They die when they're younger, and they're also 
pretty heavy, right? So there's some pretty yeah. obvious things that come out of that. So uh, it's it's kind of interesting. Gonna make to me about. cry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Do you have a great day? Didn't mean to I do. Oh, we were well, right okay. away that they're called heartbreak dogs because oh, they're their so their hearts break. Yeah. There's so there's big sweet dogs and they die young. So they are. They're adorable. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah, I think I think that covers it for what was discussed in uh the chapter. Did you go to we talked a little bit about facets a couple of weeks ago, I thought. Kind of like uh GG facet and stuff. I wasn't sure if there's anything else anyone else wanted to cover. There is always so much to learn. Like, I constantly learn about ggplot, and I know, yeah. You know, I I had a podcast about Tidy Tuesday that, <laughs> like, I was doing all kinds of crazy plots every week, and I still learn yeah. things all the time. Yeah. Um, so, like, you know, we could go on forever, and if you know, if you're listening to this later or whatever, and you're like, I don't know any of this stuff, that yeah, like. No one knows all of this stuff. Yeah. Um, that's why there's the whole gallery of extensions because hundreds of people have written packages to do different and you know, you will find like someone asked about um like Sankey diagrams, also known as alluvial yeah, plots. And they were asking um asking, you know, what is it called and how do you do this in R? And they got like I don't I don't remember how many different replies because there are so many ways to do it. It has multiple names and multiple ways to do it in R. And they're and so, done so differently. Like every yeah. package, it's like a completely different world on how they do it. There's no way to like go from one quickly to the other. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. and I don't know if you saw in chat that Flores asked for the, the spelling of the name of plot, the plot, like if you could type it out. Oh, a tribute the, plot. The one, Wait, yeah. Which one? A, a tribute plot? That one. Yeah. No, no, no. The the from your paper, the first one that you showed oh, with the yeah, yeah. Uh, different me, uh, bars. Yes. There's uh attribute it's from the upsetter package. Okay. Yeah, so it's from the upsetter package. I will right. also give you a link to that. Okay. Um actually, in my opinion, it's pretty straightforward to use. But yeah, they they do some lovely plots, and they have a couple other metrics you can add to it too like this bottom stuff too when you know i also added like the histogram on the side here it's really really pretty yeah cool yeah all right uh one, one thing uh when it comes to plotting that i've always um wanted to get better at that i just haven't had time for is when i'm doing groups you can do an interaction between groups using the colon function and then you can have that be tied into the facet wrap somehow I don't really, and every time I see it, I'm like, I wish I could do this, but I end up just making multiple plots. I'm not sure if you, if any of you know anything about that. Uh, I, I, I wish I was smart enough to like right now. make a, I wish I was smart enough to make an example, but I, I don't, it'd be like, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have an example on hand, but it'd be like group equals uh, group X colon uh, group underscore y or something like that. And then you could facet wrap that in uh, in like the facet wrap somehow. I, I don't have an example, so, so this isn't this would this wouldn't output anything. Uh, I don't know. I wasn't sure if any of you knew anything. Or it might be color, it might be a color or fill X, Y. And so it'll make a, a conditional color based off the two groups. And then you can facet them and then it'll show it. I, I can't really remember exactly how it works, but it was super neat. And uh, I I never been able to <laughs> figure it out fully. So, or I just haven't spent the time to. So I was looking sure if anyone else had. Well, if you, uh, if you find uh, an example you, I'm easy to nerd snipe in that way. Of, oh, how, how does this work? How yeah. how can people make this work? I I don't understand. That's like you know the plot I shared up above from Tidy Tuesday a few years ago. Someone made a plot in uh, one of the non R like JavaScript mm -hmm. things, and so I was like, well, I'll bet you could do that in R, and 
oh, therefore what? spent tons and tons of time. And actually theirs was circles and I did circles first, but squares or you know, rectangles show the data better. So I also, like, updated it to do that. Pleasing, right? It's aesthetically yeah. pleasing going from one square to another, right? That's really yeah. cool. Whoa. And so, yeah, that was that one was just deep, deep dive into all kinds of craziness. Uh, got some help from Thomas Lynn Peterson on that one. <laughs> oh, that's, oh, that's amazing. What you need. Was this so, GG Animate as well? Yes. So yeah, that's okay. purely yeah, 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 yeah. plot and GG Animate. There's no like wow. in the codes in that folder. That's um, amazing. I did have to do, I think, if I'm remembering right, like I would, I called um, some functions to figure out the layout. And then I would have to like, um, I don't know. I, I remember I did something and now like, I think if I did it again, it's probably a lot easier because now I understand the objects that are created by ggplot yeah. a little bit better. And you can just pull the data out of those objects. Um, I'll have to go look at that code again and maybe rewrite it how I would write it now. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like you can do anything. <laughs> it's kind of the... It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a keynote in 2020 um for the POSIT conference or I guess it was our our studio conference at the time where um the keynotes were from Google and they did want a word to vec example that was all animated and they did it all in like JavaScript and D3 and they're like, oh someone should recreate that in R. And like I keep on thinking about doing it, but I, the undertaking is like nearly epic, I feel like. I'm sure it's not as hard as I'm making it out to be. But it's a very similar process where it's like, oh, how do you get all these moving parts to work very aesthetically? It's it's really interesting. Yeah. Well, great. I think I think that covers this chapter. I know we there wasn't a lot of like formal discussion or formal um formal presentation, <laughs> but I think I think we did a good job. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, it was. I, yeah. I like, I, you know, like I said, I don't know if someone who's like new to ggplot is going to get a ton out of this conversation, yeah. but yeah, uh, the book has, you know, good material that, um, and, and there's always more to learn. There's a whole ggplot2 book that, uh, actually, I think the book club for that just finished today. Um, and yeah, there's always more to learn. So very cool. What the chapter also had it is uh, date breaks and date labels um, arguments that date scales can take. I found that uh, quite cool. It's it used the presidential's uh, data set. Um, yeah, you're right. Let me. Uh, I'm actually going to reshare my screen really quickly. Thank you for bringing that up. The dates, it's like a game changer. If you remember, oh, right. if, if you remember the days before scale x date existed, <laughs> it was it was uh, it was a lot. Like it was very akin to. Um, Decast, yeah. you know what I mean. It was very similar to the amount of pain that you would get trying to pivot data using uh, the cat statements. Um, let me see. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> right, I don't know this. Am I sharing the right screen? Okay, yeah, yeah. So they have the uh, the scale x date argument here, where you can change the label <laughs> and yeah, it's a presidential start. Pretty awesome. This is like a game changer, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of, yeah, all the tricks that I have done in the past to just get those last two digits and, you know, um, or order as create a this, man manually. like do it, basically do what the function is doing, but doing it manually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Turning sure. into a character and taking the last two letters, whatever the last two characters, and yeah. or just do this. So, yeah making um, months of factor somehow and then ordering it and yeah. then oh yeah oh yeah. and doing things like every two days or every you know three months or whatever yes yeah uh, the date breaks uh, argument can also take strings like four years uh, it was in one of yeah. the exercises to do it uh, for that uh yeah 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 it's really cool um yeah you know they that's kind of the whole thing is they try to make things just kind of work uh, <laughs> as yeah. much as possible, font sizing yeah. slash saving can still be in the doesn't necessarily work how you think it's going to arena. I think, but uh, they're working on it. So, <laughs> yeah. I also like another point about logs. The scale y log and scale x log are like 
super helpful as far as like showing the data on the same axes, but still being able to like see the results. Wait, uh, do you know a way to easily uh, change the grid line pattern according to the lock uh, distribution so that you do not have um, yeah, the regularly spaced grid lines, but as if in a lock scale, because it is a lock scale. So I yeah. mean that you would see grid lines, for example, for 0 0.4, 5, 6, 7, up to 0 0.9. So between the 0 0.3 and 1.0 uh, labels. So without okay. having them labeled. But but then uh, you would see that between 0 0.3 and 0 0.4, there would be more space and then the space would diminish. I have yeah. created such plots, but I had to create a matrix or a data frame to to yeah. to do it. To do it, but it would be nice if there were a function to do it. Yeah, I I so this is another paper I published a while ago that I don't have access to, so I just use SciHub to get it, which I think is hilarious. But um, outside of that, um, this supply I also made an R. It's on new clustering versus uh, in 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 ventilator versus uh, healthy control kind of thing. And you know, so here, you know, you use scale by log, but I had to manually add in the right. That's the only way I could figure out how to do it is essentially I would use either sequence in the break statement of the scale X log, or I would um or I would just manually input the values of interest. And it's usually a series of sequences. So I'll do like a sequence, yeah, it's like 10, 50, 100, and so on and so forth. And then I wanted some extra dash lines there. So I added some extra ones that wouldn't get labeled themselves. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I was just wondering if there were a shortcut to do it. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know it off of my head, but but it's nice, yeah, yeah. Well, we only have uh, right. four minutes left. Is there yeah. any, uh, we're, we, we somehow filled the time. That's awesome. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I think we did great. great. This, yeah. Like I said, this is what I prefer. Like, I like to meet yeah. even when we're not ready. I just was super not ready today. So, totally fine. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it like, you know, you, we can limp through with the discussion usually. And so I'm glad we did. Yeah. Awesome. So, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you all for coming and for the discussion. I think that helped <laughs> move things forward. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Dominic. All right. It was really, yeah, really yeah. Uh, nice fun. Yes. All right. Awesome. Cool. Um, I will. Um, uh, oh, it's. I think it's you next week. Is that right, Flores? Does that sound? Oh yes, that's right. Yeah. So next week we have um, logical vectors. So we we're getting into like the types chapters where it's all the different types of things that you can have in our cool. um so very awesome. cool all right i will see everybody next week all right see you. See you. bye, bye. bye.